Well, blessings to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to worship and special welcome to visitors and guests that may be with us. And if you are with us for the first time or have been here just a handful of times, right outside of our sanctuary is a welcome center. And there is someone there uh, that would love just to answer any questions that you might have to make a simple connection. And we have just a no strings attached gift, uh, drinks to our uh, coffee bar downstairs, information about who we are. And we would love just to make a simple connection and say hello. So take advantage of that this morning. So again, welcome to worship. So before we begin uh, to sing, uh, could you just stand to your feet with someone near to you? Could you shake a hand? Uh, would you meet each other? If you see a new face, introduce yourself this morning. was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met. I was breathing
you can have a seat for a moment. We have uh, been unpacking our worship value over these last few weeks, and this is our worship value for here at Third Church. It says, we are committed as the people of God coming together to worshiping passionately, reverently, expressively, creatively, and glorifying the triune God. And this has been our simple definition, description of worship. David, that next slide, please. Worship is the intentional act of giving worth by the bowing of our hearts, of our minds, and of our bodies. And today, I want to look at this word expressively. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie, very transparent here. This word makes me very anxious when I begin to talk about it, because I might rather talk about sex and money than talking about being expressive in worship. And because there is a tension in the worshiping community over this idea of us being expressive. David, can you give me, uh, give me this? So I, wa I want to frame it up like this, and we know this to be true, is that what we do as followers of Jesus, it's based on relationship. Relationship is at the center of our faith in Jesus, okay? Worship and praise as expressions are key in cultivating our relationship with God. So we're about relationship and these things that we do, all the different ways that we worship and praise are all important for cultivating our relationship with Jesus. But there is this tension expression. And I wanna, what I want us to do is I wanna ask you guys to enter into some conversation. And so I want us to answer some of this. So why might God invite us to express our relationship with him in ways that are seen, heard, felt, and tangible? So expressiveness. So with someone near to you, let's just take a minute or two. And why would God invite us to do that? Okay, why might he express? So let's do that. Take a minute. Let's talk with one another. Go. All right, I, I want some feedback from you guys. So you're gonna have to be a little bit loud because I'm a little further away than Kevin is when he's out amongst us. But let's try to answer this question congregationally. Why might God ask us to express himself in ways that are seen, heard, felt, tangible? So give me some responses. Be courageous and bold. So to glorify God. God is glorified when we express praise unto him. Other things. So edify, it is edifying unto God. It's also edifying and encouraging unto us. We'll unpack that down the, in the next couple weeks. Other things, why might God cause, call us to express our, our praise and our worship? It's a witness to unbelievers. Witness to unbelievers, yes. Yes, he calls us to not hold back in the same way that creation is bringing glory and honor unto him. We, as his creation, get to also join in and in glorifying. Anything else? All good answers. Yes, yes. So Jamie and Tyler down here in the front, when he comes home, they're one year old, there is an expressiveness, and we know this with children, that is seen when a parent comes into the room. There is a joy and an excitement. A lot of times it's hands raised up. There's this ways that relationship is always expressed. We're gonna, again, we're gonna unpack this in the weeks to come. And so these are great answers, and these are things that we have to wrestle with because this is a tension for us. And in Reformed Church, where we're very stoic and very 
unexpressive. Uh, I want us to really enter into this conversation. And so we're ending the conversation today because we're going to carry it on. But I would love to hear from you. I'd love to have you email me your thoughts, your concerns, all this. When we talk about the expressiveness of worship and of praise, you know, why does God invite us into that? And what's the tension for us? Okay, so we're going to unpack it more. I know I'm kind of leaving us, I'm cutting us off. I know that feels weird, um, but we're going to unpack it in the next weeks to come. So let's pray, and then we're going to continue to worship. But I want us to be thinking about this. Like, what ways, Lord, why would I express, and why is this so important? So Heavenly Father, this morning we come today, and Lord, I confess that there's just things that I don't understand beyond my, my knowledge, my wisdom, same thing for us, and yet we know, Lord, we want to continue to grow in our relationship with you. And Father, I know that at your heart, you are a good father, that you love to give good gifts unto your children. And Lord, there is something I know important and powerful, powerful when we learn to express from our hearts, when we begin to think rightly in our minds, and when we enter in with our physical bodies uh, when, we re when we worship you and praise you in all three ways, Lord, uh, we, I think, we most glorify and honor you and are most connected to you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would be stirring something in us uh, so that we would know who you are in greater and deeper ways, that we would know who we are by what you are saying over us. And in this moment, we continue to give you praise and to give you worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll continue the conversation, but uh, in the meantime, would you stand? Let's continue to praise. Let's continue to worship through song this morning. Crazy. Crazy mortal one. Praise God in common, praise Father Spirit Son.
Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You will be praised. So together as the body of Christ, can we declare this from the Psalms? Let's say this together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen and amen. You may have a seat, and at this time, we'll continue to worship through the giving of our ties and of our offerings. And uh, we're going to teach you guys another new song. Again, we've been on a rampage here with new songs, so give us a little bit of grace. And uh, the one that we're going to teach you this morning is really about coming into the holiness of God's presence. And we know that we're two or more gathered. Uh, he is here in our midst. And uh, there's this unique reality of God is with us and we draw unto him. And I want to read this from Hebrews 10, 19 through 23, because this is where this song is rooted at. And some of the kind of the biblical imagery within this song could, could throw us a little bit if we don't understand the context of Scripture. And uh, if we go back to the Old Testament, we know that, uh, that only a certain person, the high priest, could come into the Lord's presence once a year, and that there was a separation between God and his people. Jesus comes, and on this cross, he makes a way in his death, in his sacrifice for our sins so that those who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior can actually be brought back into relationship 
with him. And so there is this reality and this truth that we actually now can come with boldness, with confidence into God's presence. And it says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, we could say enter into his presence by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain. There was a curtain that separated the people of God from Jesus or from God. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And so this song is about us coming in, drawing in confidently into the holiness, into the presence of God. Jesus is in this room Veil is torn and 
the doors fling wide, see glory as I run inside your throne room. Before you, I bow. The veil is torn and the doors fling wide, see glory as I run We're amazed, Lord, that you so deeply want a relationship with us that is rich and full in so many ways. We thank you that you who are so high and holy have made yourself so accessible. You long so deeply for a deep abiding and intimate relationship with each of us. You're so patient and long-suffering, waiting for us to respond to you. And so you just want to say thank you. We bless you and we praise you, Lord, that we are learning more and more about being a people of praise and prayer a people of obedience and kindness, a people of courage and faith. So we bless you and we praise you, Lord. Would you pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and friends? If you don't know those words, they'll be on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. I really, behind the wall, I was changing my shirt, and I listened to your voices as you were sharing together in smaller groups, and I'd like to thank you for that, for, for risking uh, in, the, in worship, corporate worship, talking together. I'd like to ask for more of that at the end of this service, so can I have slide number eight, please? Where I'd like to go is invite us for some conversation at the end of the teaching time. We're going to focus on the word blameless this morning. But I would, I'm going to unpack that for you. But I guess the question I would ask is, what kind of witness does your lifestyle reveal? If someone follows you on social media, what would your, whatever you post reveal about you? Is your lifestyle a one that points to Jesus? Does it point well? And then I'd like to ask a question. Could remembering the final judgment positively impact how you live? And this is really interesting. After the, I've not talked about this since 2014. Someone followed me downstairs and wanted to talk and said, I have never heard this before. So what I, where I'd like to go when talking about final judgment, I hope surprises you. I think we have some wrong impressions. And so what I'd like to do is really encourage, because I think where I'm going with this is a final judgment is so positive, not negative. So let's look at that together. Could you open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 24. And I'm particularly interested in verse 16 and then in verse uh, 25. So I'm going to read those two with you, and then we'll read the whole chapter. And then we'll talk about living a blameless life to honor Jesus. 
So look at verse 16, chapter 20, verse 4, verse 16. This is repeated three times, three consecutive chapters, something like this. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men, God and people. In verse 24, he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ, and then 25, as Paul talked about faith, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. So those two verses I want to focus on, but let's go back to verse 1. Let's read uh, Acts chapter 24. Please hear the words of the Lord. Five days, five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought charges against Paul before the governor, whose name was Felix. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have long enjoyed a period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere, and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We found this man, Paul, to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among all Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned motion for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. Now look at this next phrase. And I have the same hope in God as these men have that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem bringing, to bring gifts, my people's gifts to the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially unclean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there were some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you today. So look at in verse 20, in verse 15, you have resurrection. In verse 21, resurrection. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but, told, but gave him some freedom to permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Governor Felix with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about, look what he speaks about, faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. The literal word is he was terrified. And he said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Now look at verse 26. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with Paul. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So verse 16, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Verse 25, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. People of God, this is the word of God. Can we talk about blameless? Can I have slide number four, please? What well, about the word blameless? The blameless does not mean perfect. So three times near the end of this chapter of, of Acts, he's going to talk about the idea of living a blameless life. So a blameless life is a life that honors Jesus. It's not a perfect life, but meaning what I do and how I live you would say Kevin's life points us to Jesus. So he said, Paul says on trial, I have lived in a, chosen to live a blameless life. He did it three different times. So why is living a blameless life important? 
Well, it provided credibility and authority. I've told you this before, but quickly again. The earliest Christians refused to let baby girls die because only boys were important. So they picked up left babies all over the Roman Empire and raised the babies in their Christian communities. They cared for the sick. When the plagues went through the Roman Empire, the Christians chose not to flee. The Christians stayed and cared for the dying, buried the dead. Oftentimes, they died too. Some were inoculated from the diseases and lived a life then of service. So the credibility of the Christians was incredible. If you didn't have a place to stay or did not have food, they would offer that to you. And Jason Henry at the well taught me something really, really important. If you, if, if, if you ever have a chance, ask Jason to explain to you how the poor, how the middle class, and how the wealthy use money. Think about money. And one of the things that Jason said to me, and I'm talking about now about credibility and authority, Jason said the poor across human history often have what I have is yours. So if I don't have something and you do, the poor think we share with each other. So I may give you whatever I have and I have nothing, but for just today, right now, we share what we have. The middle class is always striving to get ahead, to achieve more, to, uh, to accomplish more. And the wealthiest of the wealthy are trying to network to expand their wealth and their influence. But the poor people, the poorest of the poor, are always saying, what I have is yours. So most of the people who followed Jesus initially were poor people. So their credibility was, we'll take care of the sick. We'll take care of babies. We'll share what you have. And so because they lived a blameless life, people went, well, if that's what followers of Jesus are like, at least I'll give them a hearing. How about the next one? It shielded them when attacked. It shielded them from what? From criticism. If you read the earliest stories of the martyrs, so often they would go to their deaths with eyes fixed on Christ, with strength and courage, even as they were being brutally killed. And people said, look how they lived and look how they died. They lived blameless lives. And the last one, they learned and chose to do this with intentionality. Let me really quickly again, this comes from the research by Jerry Sitzer, the book will be released soon, entitled The Third Way. I think I told you this before, but real quick, 2,000 years ago, if you were going to be a follower of Jesus, you followed this protocol for two years. You had a sponsor, another woman, another man, who helped expose you to the things of Christ. Three hours a day after you worked, as a slave, you worked, you would spend three hours together with others in the community learning about Jesus and learning about the kingdom of God. You did that for two years. In Holy Week of two years, You'd be exercised. All demons would be cast out of you. So you were pure and holy. On Easter morning, when the sun rose, you'd go to the nearest moving water. You would literally take off all your clothes. You'd walk down into the water, and you'd put under the water three times. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you came up, they would put white garments on you, and you'd receive the kiss of peace because you now were a brother or a sister. You'd walk into the place of worship, their homes, you received the Lord's Supper because now you were part of the body. And you were anointed with oil. And now you were part of the family of God. Now why is that so important? Because in the first several centuries, there was a high probability you would be arrested and there was a possibility you'd be killed for following Jesus. So what they wanted were women and men, boys and girls, who were deeply committed to the cause of Christ. They weren't just like, I love Jesus. No, these people, these people were committed to Christ. So their reputation was blameless. And this phrase now comes in the second century. They outloved and they outlived their opponents. Outloved meaning more acts of kindness were given through the Christian community than through the non, and they outlived, meaning they lived a full life, even if life was brief. So Paul said, as he's on trial before the governor, Felix, let me tell you about Felix. Felix was the first slave who became a Roman governor official. Crazy stories, he became a governor, he has power. He was ruthless in power, he was lusting to the max, and he loved money. His wife, Drusilla, is his third wife. When he stole her from another man, she was 16. She was the great-granddaughter of Herod the Great, one who had all the babies killed when Jesus was born. 
There is blood in that family for generations. This is how the Roman emperor described Governor Felix. He was lusting and greedy for power. He had the power of a king, and he had the mind of a slave. He would kill people for any and all reasons. He would steal anything from you. He would do anything for his power and his lust for power and for sex. Paul stands before this man and his wife and says, I can say before you and all people, I have lived a blameless life. Now, let me ask you a question. If people follow you on social media, what do they see about your relationship with Christ from what you post, from what you share, from what you reveal? People with whom you go to school or people with whom you work, do you live a life that they would call blameless, not perfect, a, la a lifestyle that points to Jesus? So that's what Paul is saying. He says, you know, Governor Felix, you've watched. You know my life. So that word blameless, I hope that sticks with you. Now compare that with how the, the, king, the governor responds in verse 26. As Paul talked about righteousness, this is right relationships with God and people, because obviously he, is not, he doesn't follow the Jesus the way. Self-control, he has none. Multiple wives, killing people, see, get all kinds of money. The judgment to come, Felix was terrified. Now why was he terrified? Because, because Paul explained the judgment to come. So I'm going to talk about judgment for a little bit. But before I do, can I just, will you help me? When you hear the words, the final judgment, what do you think of? Can you people just throw some things to me? Let's find out kind of temperature in the room. The final judgment, what do you think, what happens at the final judgment? Inventory of your life, says Marcy. Okay, somebody else. What happens in the final judgment? So let me back up. When is the final judgment? Jesus comes back in glory. All of the world, everyone sees him. Everyone who has died rises from the dead. Everyone has a, a new body because you're going to need bodies. So everyone who's died has a body. All living has a body. Jesus comes, and what happens? What happens at the final judgment? Well, I'll be judged, but, what, but, 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 I'm, but I'm, I'm gonna, that's right, but I want to I surprise you where it goes. So let's talk about judgment now. Let me get, let me get to be really precise, I'm going to read real specific systematic theology statements to you. Jesus Christ will be the judge. Angels, good and evil, will be judged. Unbelievers will be judged. And believers will be judged. This will be a judgment to evaluate and bestow degrees of reward. You hear what I just said? The judgment for believers is to evaluate and bestow degrees of reward. You are not judged for your sins. What is just, the, the doctrine of justification is what? When we are, have been invited into relationship with Christ, the blood of Christ covers a multitude of sins. The word justify can be tra translated, it is just as if I have never sinned. So now in the sight of God, you are justified. Even though we live a life and we do still sin, we are seeking to live a blameless life. So when you stand, when you, so I'm just going to say, I'm assuming we're all believers. I'll get to that in a little bit. You stand before the king. He will not judge you for your salvation. It has already been taken care of. You will receive rewards for how you've lived. You think, well, that's crazy. Can I read some scripture to you? Just listen. I'm going to just read multiple scriptures. Rejoice and be glad, because great will be your reward in heaven. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. You do it in secret. Then when your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Whoever welcomes me as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes me as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. 
For the Son of Man is going to come in his glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they've done. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, since you will receive an inheritance as a reward from the Lord. Do not throw off your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated, looking ahead to his reward. How about this? End of the book. Revelation 19. Look, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So let me show you this to you. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you have committed your life to Christ, and as St. Paul says, I want to live a blameless life, that means people can see in my life and your life, we can see the fruit of the Spirit. I cannot judge anyone's salvation, but I can look for fruit. And let me say very carefully, if I don't see this, then I can ask questions. Are you actually a follower of Jesus? So if I see, if you can see in me, you use me. Do you see in me love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Do you see that in me? Do I see that in you? If we don't see it, then the question has to be asked, am I actually a follower of Jesus? I'm not, I'm not a wannabe. I'm actually committed to Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus, when you stand before him on judgment day, he will say to you, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Let me quote scripture for you. There is now therefore no for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're going to stand before the king. He's going to say, welcome home. And then he's going to show you all the things you said and did, and you will be rewarded for what you did here. Everything. So there will be different levels of reward, but we won't care because we are all together with Jesus. Now think about this. I want you to think about the very best relationship you've ever had in your life, whether it's married or un, at, the, at the, best, the best time of your relationship. In this new heaven and new earth, you'll be related to every single person in this whole new heaven and new earth better than any human relationship you've ever had. Everyone. There'll be people from every race and tribe and nation and language. And you will be absolutely in love with everyone because together we are loved by Jesus. You will stand here and he will give you rewards. Now, why is that important? Because the Bible says you will reign and rule with Christ, which means what? Somehow in this new heaven and new earth, and someone stopped me last week, what does new heaven and new earth mean? So real quickly, somehow when Christ returns, this earth will be absolutely, completely, beautifully renewed. It will be the Garden of Eden on steroids. And it's going to be some combination of heaven and earth here. Now, let me mess with you for just a second now. So oftentimes, we think about heaven, we think where? We think up there, okay. Follow me. There are multiple heavens talked about in Scripture. There are at least three and some scholars think there could be up to seven. So where, and wait, wait, okay, okay. So when Jesus, end of Matthew, first part of Acts, when Jesus is ascending into heaven, it says he went up into the clouds. How high did he go? We don't know. Watch. What if heaven is a third dimension which we can't see until we die. And what if the new heaven and new earth is something that is restored here? That's why you need a body. Jesus will have a body. And you'll be given rewards, 
and then you'll be given things to do. So the kinds of things that you love and enjoy here, scholars increasingly believe, like N.T. Wright and people like that, you will do forever in this new heaven and new earth. And it's going to be awesome. But it's only for those who believe that Jesus is the Savior, Lord, and King. What happens to those who don't believe? It's not a pretty picture. The picture is of a horrible place called hell. But let me ask you a question. If Jesus has made a way that when you die, you stand before him as though you have never sinned, he's going to tell you he loves you and welcomes you home. He's going to give you rewards for every, listen, for every single thing you've ever done. Every good thing you've ever done, you're going to get a reward. And then you're going to be filled with joy with all these other people from all these other languages. And, and you're going to be celebrating Christ in his kingdom. And you're going to have stuff to do for Christ in his kingdom. In the middle of it, we'll be celebrating. We'll be singing and dancing and praising and working and reigning. All of that. Who doesn't want to be saved? Who wants to go to hell? See, when you die, you don't just float around singing kumbaya and there's clouds up there and, and, and we, hope, we hope it's going to, oh, just how many verses of amazing grace are there? Ay, 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 ay. No, no. That's why this is good news. We are, the, the bonds of sin are broken. Death is destroyed. We have eternal life with Christ in all these people. Now go back to our story. But Felix wanted nothing to do with this. Why? Did you catch it? He wanted bribes. Now watch this. Jesus tells the parable of the soils. Do you remember the parable? A sower throws seeds. And there are different responses. What happens to the people who are interested in this all the time? The seed begins and it dies. And there's no harvest. You read 1 Timothy? Warn those who are rich that this can become the root of all evil. And many have walked away from the Lord and the faith because of this. So Paul tells him about the judgment to come. And what does he say? Manana, dude, bring some greenbacks next time you come. Question, what is this doing to your blameless lifestyle? And how will this affect your eternal rewards? It's so easy, it is so easy to live life like this. And Jesus said what? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So the question is, are you? Well, let's go to, can, can, we, can, we, do, some, can we do some conversations now? Can I have slide number um, eight, please? Let's try a little conversation. Can we take three or four minutes? So can you pick, I'd like if we could talk about both of them. So maybe if you have one or two, maybe two or three partners, just one person answer one question and the second person try to answer the second. Let's get some conversation going. What would others describe how you live in a blameless life? What kind of a witness do you bring? And the second one is, if I, if I, if I describe the final judgment accurately with what is so wonderfully possible, how might that impact how you live? Could you have some conversation together? Let's do oh, three or four minutes, okay? If you're willing, if you don't want to do it, you don't need to. If you'd like to, please do. Okay, let me try to walk you through this real quick now. So let, let me walk you through, let's, let's walk through what it means to be a follower of Jesus. At some point, at some time, as in the Reformed tradition, we believe the Lord initiates, invites us into an eternal relationship. As we respond, there is something called regeneration. There is new birth. 
We are new creations in Christ, and we are justified. The blood of Christ covers a multitude of sins. As far as the east is from the west, the scripture says, so far has he removed our transgression from us. So now we are in the family of God. We are children of God. We are invited to live a blameless life. Why? So that by how we live in word and deed, we point people to Christ in his kingdom. As we live this life, increasingly we look like Jesus, we bring his kingdom, and then we die. When our die, our spirits go where, to wherever Jesus invites them, paradise someplace, but our bodies are in the ground. When Jesus comes back as the reigning king, everyone who has died will rise from the ground, from the sea, with bodies. We who are still alive with bodies will meet Christ. All believers will stand before the king. He will welcome us home, well done, and he will give us rewards. And then he releases us with all these other people in his glorious eternal kingdom. Why would anyone not want to be a follower of Jesus? Flipping it. If you flip off Jesus now, you'll be flipping him off forever. And that's the crazy story that we live in. And that's the story the early church shared. Jesus lived and died and rose, and they lived with resurrection hope. Why? So that that's the future. It's hope that Christ has risen. That's the good news. So let me ask you a question. Two. If we watched what you posted on social media this week, if we followed you at school, at work, or at home, what would we say about how you lived? And one day when you stand before the king, what will he say to you? And what will you say to him? Will he say, depart from me? I never knew you. Or will he say, welcome home? Here are your rewards. I love you. Let's do the next bazillion years together. Ain't that good news? Let's pray. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are and for what you've accomplished. Can I invite you just to be expressive in your own heart for the, all the good that is tied in your salvation? Would you bless the Lord? for all that he has provided, all that he is providing, and what is hoped for the future. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, may I invite you today to take a first step. Would you take a first step in following the one who wants to give you the best life ever. So Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. As we build our lives on you and you build your, lives through our, your life through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe.
put our trust in you, Lord, as we build our lives on you.
So could we come across the aisles and could we just join hands as we end our morning by singing doxology? Sing this together as a body of Christ. And praise God from whom all blessings You sound fantastic. Wow. Just hold hand for just one more second. I just want to express sympathy to the Dunnick and Stainuk families. I see Carl and Connie. Uh, Carl's brother, uh, Earl, passed away. His funeral's tomorrow at 1.30. And then Wednesday, we have a funeral for a father-in-law, J.B. Stainhook, at 1.30. So could you remember these loved ones in your thoughts and your prayers? If you'd like to receive communion, elders are ready to serve you. And this is the last day for the place of prayer for a month. So if you'd like someone to pray with you and for you, we invite you to go there. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God our Father, may the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen. Hugs and high fives out the door.